Well, hey there, and welcome to week two of Understanding Revelation as we dive into Revelation chapters one through three. This week, as we were reading those, and I did this in the study with me, there is so much going on when you start looking at cross-references, when you start looking at the meaning of the passage. It is so rich, so deep. It took me two hours in the study with me just to read through Revelation, and then more time to kind of think through, you know, what is this really saying? What is this all about? It's a lot of depth. And in this video, I just want to share with you a quick overview, kind of a big picture, so you can kind of capture the most important aspects of what the first three chapters of Revelation are all about. And looking at Revelation from kind of four different interpretations, four different lenses that I explained in the video last week, you can see that here for all of the information. I'm going to give you a quick interpretation of how each of these views interprets these first three chapters. In the historicist approach, John is given a vision of Christ who announces that he is to write of things that would soon begin to take place and which would extend through the entire age of the church. The key for the historicist view was that each one of these churches was not a historical church that was in Asia, but rather was a symbol of the different ages of church history. So the first church, Ephesus, would be about the early church at the time, and then it would progress forward through time, showing kind of the the way that the church would respond to Christ and Christ's call to them at each time period. By contrast, the preterist approach is the opposite of this. This is the idea that Revelation is referring to things in the past. In this view, Christ appears to John on Patmos, commissioning him to write things that would soon afterwards find fulfillment in the fall of Jerusalem. So the key here is that he was writing to these historic churches in their exact moment, and that it was referring to things that were coming up very soon. The letter reflects the conditions prevailing in seven churches in the Roman province of Asia prior to the Jewish War of AD 66 through 70. The next view, the futurist approach, which sees Revelation predicting events in the future as the primary purpose, sees Revelation like this. While a prisoner on the Isle of Patmos, John sees a vision of Christ commanding him to write of events that would be fulfilled at the end of the present age, just prior to the second coming. So the key is that the thrust of the book is about stuff that's coming at the end of time, the end of this present age before the new age begins. Some futurists take the letters in the same manner as do the historicists, so that it's throughout different ages of church history, while others take them more as do the preterists or those taking the idealist approach. And so, you know, taking them as looking at the historical context that they were written to or as being more symbolic of churches in general like the idealists were about to see. Futurists are probably the most varied in their interpretations. The last view, the idealist approach, which focuses not on the historic application, but rather the symbolic meaning of Revelation, sees it like this. The symbolic vision of Christ depicts his glorious character and sovereignty, conveying Christ's sovereign involvement in the affairs of the world and of the church, including his intimate concerns for his suffering servants. The churches resemble churches that might exist at any time throughout the church age, and the letters are applicable to any churches that may share their conditions. The number seven is symbolic, suggesting the application to the whole Christian church of all ages. This number of completion and fullness. So what what do you think? You know, as you've read through Revelation, which one of these stands out to you? I'll just share for me the two points of view that I think both have some merit, um, particularly are... Um, Not the full preterist approach, but the preterist idea of viewing these as letters to churches in specific contexts. As I've read through Revelation, it really did feel like genuine letters written to genuine churches. Not symbolic letters to symbolic churches, but to churches that existed in John's day and needed these kind of encouragements and practical messages that Christ was revealing. But also, I see how there is some universal truth in all of this. I think the idealist approach which focuses on symbolism is worth taking. We can ask, how did the message to this historic church apply to churches like ours today? Are we similar to this one or that one? And if so, what advice does God give us? How is Christ calling us to follow him in our current church setting? Regardless of which approach you take, Revelation 1 through 3 stands out from the rest of the book, and I think it's probably the easiest to read and easiest to understand. Chapter 1 is the introduction to the letter, where John lets us know who he is, 
who he is writing to, and introduces the vision he had and shares that Christ is calling him to share this message. Chapters 2 and 3 are um, a series of letters written to the seven churches. These are going to include some praise for good works, some criticism, um, and for many churches, both. One of the things that stood out to me as I was reading is how full of biblical allusions or references this is. Chapter 1 became so green with highlighter as I was reading because there are so many references to the Old Testament. This is a deep book, and you could spend a lot of time just reading through the cross-references. And I think I'm going to have to come back to Revelation maybe again and again to explore this depth. So looking specifically at chapter 1, the chapter starts with a brief prologue. So this is going to be the first three verses, and it's not in first person yet. So it's describing John from the third person to introduce the letter. Then, starting in verse 4, John introduces himself and moves to first person, explaining what he saw and what God, what Christ told him to write. The letter starts in a very normal fashion with a benediction or an opening prayer of grace and peace. If you've read other New Testament letters, you've seen this before and this format feels very familiar. One thing that really stood out to me in this is the Trinitarian nature of this prayer. The grace and peace of God, the Father, who's represented as the Eternal One, of the seven spirits, which as I've been reflecting on and reading more commentaries, I think is a reference to the Holy Spirit, and of Jesus Christ. So we have this idea of Trinity clearly here, and then we're going to see that as Christ talks in this, that he refers to himself in the same way that God is. So we have the separate persons of the Trinity, while at the same time affirming their unity as one God. The appearance of Christ to John brings a message to deliver, but even in the appearance of Christ himself, we see the message. Hearing what Christ looks like tells us about what God is revealing through this vision. The general character of the vision is one of the glory of Christ, the shining face being reminiscent of that which John had seen on the Mount of Transfiguration decades earlier. That was in Matthew 17. According to various expositors, the golden band worn across the chest is an emblem of high rank in the ancient world, and the long linen garment is probably priestly. White hair is the emblem of age and honor and possibly wisdom. But the shining white hair, I think, is more than just age. It's this this image of purity and glory and power. The flaming eyes convey the idea of piercing vision. And his feet of fine brass suggest the irresistibility of his judgment, as he will later tread on the great winepress of wrath of God. The two-edged sword from his mouth can hardly refer to anything other than his word. And the meaning of the seven stars is given in verse 20. So we have this this majestic picture of Christ coming. And then we're going to see how different pieces of this image relate to different churches, revealing and showing the message in a more profound way than the words on paper alone. In chapter 1, Christ reveals to John some of the interpretations of the vision. Particularly, he talks about the seven golden lampstands and the seven stars. The seven golden lampstands represent the seven churches that this letter is written to. The seven churches, and it's called Asia, but this is not the continent of Asia as we know it today. Rather, this is the province of Asia in the Roman Empire. So this is in the region of like modern Turkey. And um, so we shouldn't be confused when we see Asia in the Bible. It's not talking about like um, China, Korea, Japan. It's talking about that region of Turkey that was known in the Roman Empire as Asia. So that was the seven golden lampstands. What about the seven stars? The seven stars are the seven angels of the churches. And I think there are two main interpretations of what seven angels refers to, the angels of the churches. The first and probably most obvious is that it's angel like we use the word today, referring to a messenger from God, a messenger from heaven, but not a human one, an angelic one. 
And that is often how angel is used in the Bible. It's definitely how angel is used throughout the rest of Revelation, with the exception possibly of here. So that's one interpretation, that there are angels, maybe protective angels, associated with each church. The other interpretation, and the one that I I think seems more likely to me, is that angel is being used here in the way that the kind of Greek word has its original meaning. And that is just a messenger. You see, this is a letter being written to each of these seven churches, and presumably a messenger is going to read that to the congregation. This messenger might be the one kind of receiving the letter. It may be a pastor, elder, leader within the church. But someone is going to share this letter as a message and read it out to the church. This isn't going out in a mass email or something. I think it's probably most likely that the term angel here is referring to the messenger who shares this with the church. That would explain in chapter 2 why it's addressed to the angel, because the angel is the one sharing it. But either way, whether it's a human messenger or an angelic messenger, this message is going to be sent through this angel to the church. Then as we move into chapter 2 and 3, we're going to see the next section is just letters to each of these churches. Some are a little longer, some are a little shorter, and we're going to take a quick look at each of those and kind of what it reveals about the church. The first letter was written to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was the largest and most important city in the Roman province of Asia. The population was around 250,000, so a bit smaller than cities as we think of them today for being large cities, but this was a big city during the time. The church in Ephesus was established by Paul and featured significant ministers described in Scripture, including Apollos, Priscilla, Aquila, and Timothy. Probably the Apostle John lived here before being banished to the island of Patmos. So he was probably here. He was banished to the island, and on the island he had this vision, and now this is the message going to that church that he had been part of. Ephesus received wonderful early message praising their labor, patience, intolerance of those who are evil, which is kind of, I think, countercultural today, right? Like tolerance is the name of the game, but there was something, and not necessarily, certainly not an idea of mistreating, but there was something in Revelation that churches which didn't tolerate evil were praised in a way they may not be in our modern setting. And then lastly, discernment towards false apostles and false teachers. And an example of this that was given is the Nicolaitans, which we're going to see later as well. But then the passage pivots because Christ said that he had one thing held against them. See, in all of their good actions, in all of their good teachings, in all of their good theology— They had forsaken their first love. This is a pretty clear message, a message to that historical church, but I think one that easily applies, and you can see the symbolic meaning here, right? That just doing good actions, just having good um, teaching is not enough. God calls us to have a heart of love, love to God, love for God, and love for others. So the message here is simple. It is to remember where they were, to consider how far they had fallen, to look back on their past. It was to repent, to not just be sorry, although that's part of it, but to turn around and go the other direction, to recognize that I have gone the wrong way, and to turn back to the right direction. And then to repeat to do the things they had done at first. And so to any church that finds themselves in this place of having lost their first love, you may want to remember this, to remember where you were before, how you had been serving God with passion, to repent of this change away from that, and then to repeat what you had done previously of serving God, of loving God from your heart. The next church written to is the church in Smyrna. This was the second largest city in the province of Asia, and it was known as the most beautiful. It's the only one that is still in existence today. Smyrna receives the shortest message and is one of only two churches that received no rebuke. They were experiencing grave tribulation, trials and persecution based on their faith, and they were standing firm. 
And to this church, Christ reminds them that he was dead but has returned to life. This is a promise for their future. As they are persecuted, they don't face this hopelessly, but they do it seeing the victory which has already been won that's in front of them. This is how they can go through the persecution, knowing that Christ was dead but is now alive. Here they are facing persecution, though, not just from Rome but from false Jews, as they're described here, from the synagogue of Satan. Christ is distinguishing between those who are ethnically Jews, those who are born Jewish, who may practice Jewish religion, but who reject the Messiah and persecute God's people. You know what? Following the Messiah is what it means to be Jewish. Following God as he is at work in the world is what it means to be Jewish, and persecuting the church is seen here as being satanic, a false Judaism. The third church is Pergamum, or Pergamos, and it was the capital of the province of Asia. If Ephesus was New York City, Pergamum was Washington, D.C., the central seat of power. And that idea of seat we're going to see again in a second in this book. And that idea of seat, we're going to see again in a second in this letter. It had the second largest library in the world and was the first city to raise up a temple to Caesar Augustus, to Zeus, and even to the serpent god Asclepius. We don't talk about Asclepius much today, but he was actually a pretty big draw for the city. He was a god of healing, and people would come from all over to receive healing here at Pergamum. In this chapter, it refers to this place as Satan's throne. I described it as the seat of power. It's the same image we're still seeing. The idea that this place was the kind of central seat of power for Satan. And we see this in two ways here, I think. We see this one in the Roman Empire and their belief that they were God and their false practices they led, but also in the idolatry of false gods that were worshipped here. In all of these together, you have the seat of the demonic forces at work within the Roman Empire around the Christians at play coming from and being led from this very city. Now, for this church, they had a similar problem to Ephesus, but they did not handle it so well. Unlike Ephesus, which stopped false teachings of the Nicolaitans, The church in Pergamum did not. They allowed them to go unchecked. It's not very clear what the Nicolaitans were. We we don't know exactly what they taught or what we believe, but we do know the actions that came about in this church because of their false teaching. And these actions were eating meat sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality. These are the two big things that were going on in this church. And these are also the common practices that were part of everyday life in the Roman Empire. It sounds like the church here was syncretizing, matching up the Christian faith and the Roman faith and trying to merge them so they could get along together. That you can be Christian and be part of that sacrificial system, eat the food, sacrifice to idols, no problem. Sexual immorality, that's what the Romans do, it's okay. You know, even temple prostitution, that sort of thing. And that was a serious problem. Christ reveals one clear action that this church needs to take and a picture of what will happen if they don't. The action is repentance. The church is to imitate Ephesus and clearly distinguish between the true teachings and the false, between Christ-like living and fake Christianity, which syncretizes with idolatrous and a sexually immoral culture. And then he reveals the sword coming from his mouth, represented in chapter 1. And this is how he will come to those who continue down the path. That his word will come to them, but it's not coming soft, it's not coming weak, it's coming strong to cut through all of this. So repent, repent while you can. The fourth church is Thyatira. Lydia, Paul's first convert in Philippi, was from Thyatira. The purple cloth she sold was a major product of that city, but this was pretty much the only thing the city was known for. Of the seven cities in Revelation, this is the least significant, the smallest, least important, which is somewhat surprising because it receives the longest message of any of these churches. One of the challenges that the believers face here is likely the relationship between trade guilds and idolatry. Being part of a guild was necessary to work, But part of the guild's practice was the worship of false gods. 
what were believers to do? But one person, and I think we get like a kind of a peek into the church here in a more personal way than we do with some of the other churches. One person who is referred to as Jezebel, and this is a reference to the Old Testament to the queen who led Israel into the worship of false gods and idolatry. One person who um, is referred to as Jezebel and described as a false prophet led the church here into some false teaching. Again, it's teachings of syncretizing the culture. Maybe she was telling people, it's okay to take part in these trade guilds and just follow. Maybe she was um, merely just practicing this and leading them into practice. But again, she practiced the same things, idolatry and sexual immorality, and led people down this false path. Interestingly, historicists who, remember, they view um, each one of these as referring to a historical period, they see this and the false prophets, so they see this Jezebel as being the Pope, the papacy, and the Catholic Church, which led the people astray. I I don't really think that's what's going on here, but that's kind of a picture of how the historicists would read things. For me, I see this as being about a genuine church from history, syncretizing Christianity and pagan religion, trying to stay Christian while allowing room to live like unbelievers. This has application to any church who follows the same path today. The imagery of Christ's response is plain. His eyes of fire see through and burn with judgment. His feet of bronze are unyielding and suggest that judgment will stamp out this rebellion. Interestingly, the church in Thyatira seems to suffer from the exact opposite problem of the church in Ephesus. Remember, the church in Ephesus was doing everything right, stamping out wrong teaching, but had forgotten their first love? Well, this church remembers the love. They're known for their love, for their service, for their faith and patience. I think it's maybe even possible that their love and their desire to care about and be kind and gracious to others has allowed them to let false teachings go on too far rather than calling it out. But regardless of the motivation, they have the love, but they're allowing false teachings, and they need to call that out. They need to stop that. Christ calls them to keep the love, keep the patience, but rid themselves of false teaching and hold firm to true doctrine. And number five, we have the letter to the church in Sardis. Sardis was also famous for dye, but for red dye, not purple. Now, Sardis has the unfortunate history of being conquered twice for failing to keep watch. So this is kind of just what they're known for, right? It's not that they had bad military, not that they had bad, like, um, fortifications. They just didn't watch them, and the army just marched right in. And Jesus may have been alluding to this when he warned the church here to not follow their example. He warned them, be watchful. He warned them, like, coming like a thief in the night. And there's this image here that Sardis has historically not been watchful and just allowed the enemy to march right in. Sadly, Sardis is one of the two churches that received no praise, only condemnation. See, the church in Sardis is the opposite of Jesus himself. Jesus was dead, but is in fact alive. Sardis, on the other hand, is alive in name, but in practice is dead. Judgment is coming. But for those few who remain faithful, they are promised that their name will not be blotted out from the book of life. So this is a short message to Sardis, but a clear one. They have turned away. And they really need to turn back. And those few that are remaining faithful, stay true, stay strong, even though the rest of the church is not with you on that. All right, here we are in the final two. Number six, Philadelphia. Philadelphia was a very small city, and in part because they had struggled with terrible earthquakes. In fact, a few years earlier, in AD 17, the city had been destroyed by an earthquake. So it had been completely rebuilt, But people were living in fear, you know, who knows when the next earthquake is going to come and destroy everything again. This letter introduced Jesus as the one who is holy and true, and it breaks the pattern that we've been seeing up to this part. Unlike the previous letters, this one does not reference the imagery from chapter 1. This is sent to encourage the church in Philadelphia in persecution, which will be increasing. Like Smyrna, this church faced persecution from local Jews, again referred to as the synagogue of Satan. And the the imagery of true Judaism is revealed in the promise if this church remains faithful. They will be a pillar in the temple of God. 
with the following inscription written on that pillar, the name of God, the name of the city of God, a new Jerusalem, and Christ's new name. This is a perfect description of what Israel was called to be. People who are inscribed with the name of God, the name of the Messiah, the name of the city shining as a light of God's presence to the world. This is what Israel, Judaism, really looks like. All right, and our last letter, as we wrap up chapter 3, we see the letter to Laodicea. Laodicea was a prominent and wealthy city known for being a banking center and producing black wool. It also had a prominent medical school, and it produced powder as medicine to treat eye problems. And so the church here was pretty wealthy, and you could guess that as they were prominent and wealthy, they had a high view of who they were as uh, members of the city and as believers here as part of this church. The city's water supply originated from a hot spring six miles away. So as the water would come from that spring to their city, it would become cooler and cooler along the way until it arrived at them, not cold like water from a fresh spring or hot like water from a hot spring, but just this lukewarm temperature. And that is probably what Jesus was referring to when he used this image to describe them. At the beginning here, Jesus calls himself the Amen. Now, amen is a very common term. It's used throughout Revelation and throughout the rest of the Bible, but this is the only place where it's used as a name or a title. It comes from the Hebrew expression, which is a strong affirmation of meaning, so be it. This is the kind of thing Jesus said before he said something to say, this is really true, um, that we say at the end of our prayer. It's, it's the strong affirmation But let's see, what is this church actually like? What are the Laodiceans like? Rather than living their life with this strong affirmation of the word amen, they're lukewarm. They're described as neither hot nor cold. And what does Christ call them to do? He calls them to become zealous and to repent, to do the opposite of what they are. Don't remain lukewarm, but become zealous, repent of their hearts, repent of where they are, and to see themselves like they actually are. See, they think that they're, they're fine, they're good, everything's good about them, they're prosperous. But Christ says, no, look at yourself again. He calls them to see that spiritually, the reality is that they are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And he describes himself as standing at the door knocking. All they need to do is open the door to come in. And there you go. That is the seven letters to the seven churches in the province of Asia. And a powerful message to all of us. I'm curious if any of these resonate with you. But either way, John has delivered this message and vision, and in the upcoming weeks, we're going to see more of this vision. But for now, we can look at this and see how God is calling us, how God is speaking to us through his words to these seven churches. And we'll see you next week as we move on to Revelation 4 through 7.